So last week, if you weren't here, Mike kicked off this series about five things to grow your faith. And when I heard the topic, I thought about it. I said, you know what? Who are those big faith people who I know that I look to and just go, that person gets it? And I had a handful of people in college that were that way because those of you who don't know my story because you haven't heard it before, around sophomore year in college, I kind of strayed from the church, went off my own direction. There wasn't a church nearby. Nobody was driving me to it. I wasn't involved. Little did I know what was going to bring me back to the church was someone on fire for God. Their faith was so strong. Their personality was so attractive. They were so all about God that I went, I want what you have. Brought me right back around full circle. And here I am. So if you look at this series, one of the things that I want you to strive to look at as we go through these five things is, number one, who are those people that you know that are already like that? Number two, how can you get to be like that? Because you will be absolutely amazed how much people gravitate to people who are on fire for God. There's just something about them. So just to recap, what are those five things? Again, we're going to repeat it over and over because guess what one of the key ways of learning is? Repetition. So through repetition, we're going to learn a little bit. Practical teaching, providential relationships, private spiritual disciplines, pivotal circumstances, and personal ministry. So this week, we're going to focus on practical teaching. So open up your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And hold your spot there, because that's where we're going to camp out today. But before we dive in, I want you to answer a couple of questions, not necessarily out loud, but to yourself. And a couple of them we'll address as a group. Studies are showing that church members are demanding shorter and shorter sermons. Why do you think that is? Lose people's attention. Okay, we're an ADHD society, right? As an ADHD society, we lose attention span, which, by the way, I've got an idea on this, that kids' attention span is as long as a show is between commercial breaks. Science is proving it to be true because between commercial breaks, it used to be 8 to 10 minutes, and an average kid's attention span used to be 8 to 10 minutes. Now the average span between commercial breaks is 2 to 3 minutes. And how long do you think kids' attention spans are? 2 to 3 minutes. Same thing with sermons. We can't hold attention for a 25 to 30-minute sermon because our attention span is 2 to 3 minutes. That's a little scary. Now, I've got another theory as to why people are demanding shorter sermons, and it's because of the fact that many people just want the preacher to cover the material. Just cover the material. Tell me the story. Tell me the biblical background. Tell me the history. Don't worry about forcing me to do anything. I don't really want to do anything coming out of the sermon. I just want to hear it. I want a great history lesson in ancient Greek, because that's what this lesson's in. It's in Greek. We just happened to translate it. I went to a church in Williamsburg a while back, and I walked into the church, and it was a really unique experience because big, booming church probably had 800 people per service. They ran three to four services. They're packed. Nobody shook my hand. Nobody said hello. And the preacher taught the equivalent of a 400-level theology sermon used words that I would have to go look up afterwards. Those of you who are in my youth know that I like to use big words. I love challenging youth to go look up big words after the fact and go, what does that word platitude mean again? This church was so lofty, I don't know how anybody could have been getting anything out of it unless you had a doctorate in theology. It's a really unique experience because you've got two bookends of what I think sermons are. You can have the people who just cover the story and give you the background and a nice feel good, and then you've got the, I'm going to overwhelm you with education. Somewhere in the middle is a teaching that causes application and people to do things. Somewhere in the middle of that. Many of you are already going to know this particular sermon. Many of you are already going to know the verses that we talk about. So my challenge to you is, do you approach learning as though you already know everything or as though you're looking to glean something new? I've coached sports for years. Started coaching when I was in high school. 
our coach would have us run clinics for little kids. And through college, I coached middle school, high school, college kids. I coached junior Olympic volleyball. And I would run clinics. And when you went into a clinic, you would have a kid who would come in and go, I know everything, you don't need to teach me anything. And I said, well, let me tell you something. A, your parents paid for this. And B, if you could take away one new thing, just one, then it's been worth it. And if you can come into every sermon, every worship service here and take away one thing, then that's perfect. If you can take away 10 things, that's awesome. But if you can take away one thing, then it's been worthwhile. So do you approach learning in such a way as though you already know everything, or are you striving to find something, something that you can grab and apply? There's a reason why the Bible has been around for thousand plus years, and they're teaching the same stories, because you'd think all the sermons would be preached out at this point. There's not that much material there. And we keep going back and teaching the same story over and over again. Somewhere way back when in the 11 years that I've been here, I'm pretty certain I preached on these particular verses. I'm also certain that this sermon is entirely different than that one. There's always something to grab, if you're willing, to go get it. So let's take a look at Matthew 7. We're going to read 24 through 28. And in this, Jesus is teaching about building on a solid foundation. And we find the following. Anyone who listens to my teaching and obeys me is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and ignores it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will fall with a mighty crash." Now, most of us have heard about the story about building our house on rock and building our house on sand, but I want to break it down into the groups that are impacted. When you look at a foundation, those of you who don't know my bivocational job, I work full-time job with Verizon Wireless. I used to be a construction engineer. I've seen foundations the size of Olympic swimming pools to hold up cell towers. Now, my question is, is your foundation the size of an Olympic swimming pool or a toothpick? What is your foundation? So I want to challenge you as we read through this. But there's a certain number of impact groups. As we look at the scripture, I find three different impact groups in this set of verses. Those who don't listen at all or don't believe. How can you apply something you've never heard? Those who listen and don't follow or put it into practice. And then there are those that listen and follow it or do it. But we need to define the difference between hear and practice. There are people who come to church faithfully every week, and they hear a message. They may go to Sunday school, and they hear a message. They go to growth groups, and they hear a message. They come to Wednesday nights, and they hear a message. You can listen all day long, but if you don't do anything, what good is it? Have you wasted your time? So this week, I was in Leesburg, Virginia for a big meeting. All right, the meeting was directors and above, so directors, executive directors, and vice presidents, and I was there, and we had a three-hour discussion on training. How do we train people? Do we bring somebody in and lecture them for a few days and then tell them to go do it? Do we give them access to the equipment, let them work on it, and then go out and go do it? Or do we immerse them in the experience and tell them, this is going to be your job, do it. Let's learn while you do it. Three-hour debate, because for years and years and years, we taught under the old methodology, which is you sit there, I'll tell you the theory behind it and how it works, and then you're going to go out in the field and work on that piece of equipment. How successful were we? It's an interesting question. Because we've done it for years. There was obviously some thought process that went into how we teach things. I've sat in training after training where I sat there and went, okay, okay. 
I don't have a clue what I'm going to do with this when I get there, but okay. And at this particular experience where our company is effectively built an immersive experience where what they do is three-day training. They walk in on day one. They tell the person, that's your piece of equipment. Go put it in service. And you're going to fail along the way, and that's okay because we're going to work with you through it. By the end of it, you're going to know that piece of equipment so well that you're going to be able to teach somebody else how to put it in service. So why is church any different? If you come listen every week and do absolutely nothing with what you've heard, how is that any different than what we were doing in the corporate world where you sit and listen, you take it in, and oh, by the way, when trials come your way, when something happens in your life, and all of a sudden you go, man, what did that guy say about that again? I know he said something about it. I don't know how to apply it. That scripture sounded really good, and at the time it it really meant something, something about houses and rocks and sand, and, and, and yeah, that really meant something but I don't know how to use it. Is that how we treat church? So let's talk about the results of the choices for a minute. Those who don't listen at all or believe at all, what's the result of that choice? When troubles come, their house falls. It has no foundation. Some of you have neighbors like this. Some of you may even be in this situation in your life where If you don't have Jesus in your life, you have no foundation. You ride the ebbs and flows of life. If things are going well, you ride a high, high, and when things are going low, you ride a low, low. Some of you know people like this. Some of you may be in this particular boat where if you don't believe in Jesus with no foundation, you ride highs, highs, and low lows. When things go great, yes, life's awesome. When things go bad, man, life stinks. And I'm in depression because of it. Some people listen and don't follow. So in this case, what I like to caveat this as or partition it out as, these are believers who come and listen every week and do nothing with it. These are people who come listen to the lesson. They go to Sunday school. They go to growth groups. They go to Wednesday nights. And they go, man, I feel great. I've listened a lot this week but I've got a separate life that I live outside of these walls, and I'm going to live that life. And those people are in a similar boat to those without a foundation. They've got a little bit of foundation because they've got something to fall back on. If you're a believer who doesn't apply anything, when life gets bad, you tend to fall down. But when you fall down, you fall onto something. Often you fall onto Jesus and have a sudden realization of your need for him. I don't know how many testimonies I've heard of people talking about life hit the lowest of the low point. And when it hit that low point, I realized Jesus was there for me. Their house collapses, but at least it has something to collapse upon. And then there are those that listen and put it into practice. There are those that stand strong when tested. There are those people who, when they read this particular scripture, the thing they grab out of it, they go, okay, I'm a believer. I want to do what Jesus says. And because of that, when rains and floods come and winds beat against it, it stands. I know some people like this, that when things are going as bad as they can possibly go, they're still okay. When life hits the point where they should have been crushed by what happened, they're okay. Because they know God has a plan and they know they're putting into practice what God says and they know that in the scripture it says life will not be easy. You will be tested and tried in this life. And they go, you know what? God said it's going to happen. It's happening. I'm okay with that because God's got a plan. He's in control. And in the end, we're going to be all right. I got some really good feedback at work in the last couple of months. I'm working a somewhat new role. Those of you who know my role at work know that I work an undefined role. You can put everybody in their little silos, and then you've got Matthew over here. And Matthew does this oddball work that isn't really defined, and nobody really knows what I'm working on at any given point of time except for the people giving me the work. And somebody comes and asks me, they said, so what do you work on? Whatever this guy or lady wants. I work the oddball projects that don't fit anywhere else. I work the oh, hey, there's an opportunity to save $15 million if we implement this new idea kind of projects that 
that just kind of go out there and they go, hey, just go do it. So recently I got some feedback from this new role. I had worked through these major presentations that the executive directors had to do once a quarter and they come out of it and the VP goes, hey, you got really good feedback from the executive directors. I said, oh, that's awesome. I love good feedback. Who doesn't, right? Their feedback wasn't that I did a fantastic job putting together PowerPoints. That was actually the feedback I expected. The feedback was, no matter what we threw at you, you just kept rolling. We threw an odd request at you, you just went and got it. We threw a curveball at you that we didn't think anybody else could figure out, you just went after it until it got finished. And I went, what cool feedback to get to not collapse under pressure where people have before. This role has eaten people up before. I've watched people have panic attacks because of working this particular project that they have to work on. And that's not to heap praise on me. What it is is to challenge you. Are you able to roll with things when they're tossed at you? Do you collapse under pressure easily? Is your house built on a rock or is it built on sand? If it's built on the rock, let me tell you about your house. Your house is really unique because it can get pounded and nothing happens. It can get beaten down. Your house can get torn to the ground and you're okay with it because you still have a foundation that's solid. North Carolina's got a really unique set of rules. If you have a house on the beach in North Carolina and a storm comes and it washes the house off the foundation, that property is then North Carolina's. You lose the property fully. If your house is still standing at all on the foundation at the end of that storm, you get to rebuild it. What an interesting perspective on life. Are we like houses in North Carolina? Can we stand on the foundation that no matter what storm comes, we get to keep our beachfront property? Or are we built on sand in such a way that our house washes away and we kind of collapse? Which one do you fit into? So there's a couple of challenges that I pull out of this. The first one is a challenge to leaders or teachers. These are those people that are teaching classes, those people that are leaders in the church or in your businesses. How often should we be teaching? This is a loaded question because as teachers, our instinct is to teach. As a leader of youth, my instinct is to teach. My job is to teach them how to act as adults. Teach them how to handle the things that are going to come their way. Teach them what problems and roadblocks they might encounter and how to overcome them. Teach them the challenges that adults face that if I can prep them just a little bit for early, that they'll overcome later. Are we teaching too much and not putting the Bible into practice enough? Are we willing to morph some or all of our teaching from sit there and listen to let's do it? There are some unique churches that I've encountered. Those of you who know, when we go through any type of schedule discussion, I love looking at what other churches are doing. I'll go and study and go, hey, that, that looks kind of cool, or hey, I like that idea. There are a couple of churches that do some really neat things on fifth Sundays, and they're not sings. Okay? There's nothing wrong with a fifth Sunday sing, but those churches on fifth Sundays do something really unique. You know what they do? They come to church at the same time as always. They divide into groups and disappear into the community and go do a couple of projects and come back. What a neat idea. What a fantastic idea. Hey, guys, guess what? Fifth Sunday, come in your work clothes. We're going to go get something done. Are we willing to try crazy ideas that would seem crazy to us but have an immediate impact on the kingdom and people outside? Could you imagine the shock of one of the neighbors down the street from here if we showed up with shovels and lawnmowers and some plants and we showed up on a Sunday morning? Talk about a curveball. Y'all are supposed to be in church. What are y'all doing out here? You're supposed to be in church. No, we're being the church. Are we sitting and listening or are we actively doing? 
Are we willing to morph some of all of our teaching? Next group, challenge to believers. Don't miss opportunities to hear the word taught and spoken. Don't take this sermon as though you need to go out and do nonstop and not get taught. Okay, I'm as guilty of this as anybody. I have now been teaching and youth pastoring. That's a verb. Yeah, we'll go with that. I've been doing that now for 11 years. I've been working with youth for almost 20 in some shape or form. Do I come into teaching like the person that goes, man, I already know this. I countered it. I've already dealt with it. And I just brush it away. Or do I actively seek to get taught? Hebrews 10.25 says, don't forsake the gathering together. If you're not in here getting taught, then you have nothing to apply. Let me reiterate that. If you're not in here getting taught when the doors are open, you're missing chances to apply scriptural teaching. Strive to be here when the doors are open. Get in part of the growth group. Growth groups are where you dive deeper. Sunday school is where you dive deeper. I can only go so far with a 30-minute sermon, but who knows what we can do in an hour. Put the teaching into practice. There's an example in this that Mike loves. Mike loves it because it involves paint. For some strange reason, Mike loves painting. I am not a fan of painting. Jacqueline will tell you, I borderline despise painting. Okay, I inherited slight tremors from my grandmother. It's not nerves, it's an actual medical condition. So if you tell me to paint a straight line, I can't. I just can't do it. So therefore, I don't like it. Because I'm not good at it. It's not really a good answer, is it? Some of y'all are back there going, man, you need to paint a little more. Roll. <laughs> Absolutely true. I can roll. I'm a fantastic roller. You make V shapes all over the place. I'm good with that. So those of you who are believers, put the teaching into practice and do, because as the scripture reads, I skipped one part on purpose. And I skipped it because it's a little harsh and because I think the harsh thing should be brought at the end so you don't forget it. Scripture there says, those who hear and do not put into practice what was taught are fools. It says they're foolish. As in Greek, basically calling you an idiot. And it's saying, basically, if you don't hear, if you're sitting there taking in the words and doing nothing with it, You've been armed with this great information. You've been armed with what the scripture says. If you do nothing with it, you're foolish. And that's really blunt, but 100% right. I can't fault somebody who's never heard the word before for not applying it. I can look at them and feel sorry for them. I can feel for what's happening in their life because they don't have any clue what it means to have a solid foundation to stand upon. They don't have any clue what it means to have a God who cares about them personally. Not some metaphysical God that's up there in the sky who doesn't care about you. But a God that cares about you and knows the number of hairs on your head. A God who is intimately concerned with what you do in your life. So that leads to the challenge to the non-believers. If you've never accepted Jesus before, if you don't have that foundation, if you don't have a restored relationship with God, ask how. Find somebody and ask. We'll talk to you about it. It's really easy. Bring Jesus into your life. If you're in that place and you're going, man, my life has had some really rocky lows and some really high highs. But man, wouldn't it be great to have foundations so that I can cruise through life? Not cruise to it that it's going to be easy, but cruise to it knowing somebody's always got my back. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be an exciting way to live life? Wouldn't it be great when things are thrown at you that you're the guy at work that they go, man, a lot of people would have crumbled under that. Somehow you made it through. 
I didn't make it through it under my power. Please don't think that this is gloating on me at all. By no means did I make it under my power. I was the stressed out kid that strived for perfection. I used to get talked to every time I got a grade less than an A. Hey, Matt, if you just applied yourself, you could make straight A pluses. Dad, I don't want to make straight A pluses. I want to have a life. And I was that kid. I was pushed really hard, pushed to succeed. I thank my dad for that. Had he not pushed me, I wouldn't be where I am. But also, through all that, I learned how to tolerate things getting grown. I learned how to overcome injury. College, I didn't blink when I got hurt. I got hurt freshman year playing volleyball. Wrecked my ankle. A lot of people would have quit. 30 days later, right back at it. That's not me. That's me leaning on someone. All right, that's the significance of where you put this. So the question there is ask how. All right, as we go to close, let's pray.